Now, I want to deal with the message uh, I'm going to call increase creates options. Mm -hmm. If you have an increase of, of, of supply of any kind, well, you have choice. And remember, we go back to the fact that when God delivered them people and they were in the wilderness, um, they, they didn't, their clothes didn't wear out, they don't have, and, and God would just give them manna from heaven and water that came out of a rock, and their needs were met. But once they crossed over the Jordan, the manna stopped, and then God created choice in the fact that if you want watermelon, well, sow watermelon, then you'll get that harvest. If you want cantaloupe, whatever you want, you have a choice of lifestyle by a free will, but we live in a sowing and reaping world. And you have to be careful because you can sow negatively or you can sow positively. But one thing's for sure, whatever you sow, the increase will be greater than what you sowed. A little seed produces hundreds of something else. So you got to be careful with what comes out of your mouth Amen. about your financial situation because you keep sowing more weeds into your future. Amen? Amen. Barry. Shut the mouth of the devil and my people and bless this word. I did not realize that we're going to sing that chain breaker song, but it's the perfect one. I want to read to you out of Acts 10.38. You're quite familiar. I guess it's probably my best, my most enjoyable scripture in the whole Bible where God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Now, most of us living in the United States right now, our oppression has to do with inflation, then prophesied recession and the economy and the Ukrainian war and COVID and all of these kind of things creates an atmosphere of, of people not being sure of the future. Gas prices, the oil shutdown, all these things that people feed off of watching the devil vision hearing the bad news rather than going to the Bible and reviewing the good news. And you either live in a lost and dying, demon-infested, sinful, anti-Christ world, or you live in a stable kingdom of God that cannot be shaken Amen. under the King of kings and Lord of lords where you rule and reign as a royal priest and as a kingly king with dominion over the devil where even the gates of hell cannot stop you, where supply is guaranteed. So you can either live in the land of lack and woe and, and, and dread, or you can live in the kingdom of prosperity where God supplies your every need and wants to create a desire you have that your joy might be full. In Jesus' name, okay. So I'm going to I'm going to start this outline. But remember, at White Dove, if you are open to the Holy Spirit being the teacher, Mike's just going to do the natural thing to the best that I can. But expect revelation that is going to bypass the limitation of your mind and and your habitual lifestyle and your false beliefs of your heart and uh, light up and feed your spirit so that you can have faith to believe the 7,500 precious promises that are already yes and amen instead of struggling in your mind, how am I going to get through this? What am I going to do? All right, so uh, I'm going to ask you to beware of the demonic oppression over finances. You know, a to show you when a person seeks money, more money, when they even get more money, great sums of money, the greater the sum, the more they begin to uh, have fear and dread at night because they always fear lawsuits, they fear catastrophes, they fear theft, they fear that somebody's going to take their money from them. 
another thing that great riches does is it causes people to be suspicious of possible friends in agreement because they never know if the person really, really loves me or, or wants to get at my money. Uh, do you really want a fellowship with me or what my money can do for you? So then you begin, the more money you have, you, it's like going up a pyramid. You get to the point where the loneliest place in the world or the people with a lot of money because now they become paranoid or dread of losing everything. And then they can't really uh, enjoy relationships because they don't know what the motive of the heart of the person is. Follow that. So that's why Jesus told us don't bow the knee to mammon, but absolutely bow the knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord wants to give us the desires of our heart in prosperity for his namesake. The covenant with Abraham, it, 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 that we would have the power, that, which means the ability to create great wealth, is to prove the covenant. Broke, busted, and disgusted is not a good witness of what Christ can do for you. On the other hand, when you bow the knee to more money, now again, you become friends with the world system. And Jesus said you're either going to be in bondage to the world system under, the, under mammon, or you're going to be a free spirit able to uh, rule and reign in this present life in a kingdom that cannot be shaken by anything in the money system. Amen. All right. If you're a spirit-filled Christian, you're going to have to divorce yourself from the woes of the world and marinate in the promises of God. You have a choice every day. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something. It's going to be easier. I feel like I'm, uh, I'm not wasting time, so to speak, to get to my outline. I'm going to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. I would like everybody to stand right now. And this is not Simon Says. This is because it's going to be easier for some people to come to the altar if they do this. I always teach that favor in the form of God's grace doing something that you can't do in your own life. You might want to, but you don't have the ability to do. James 4, 6, if we humble ourselves before the Lord, great grace comes upon us. We wouldn't want to do this at Walmart or Winn-Dixie or Rouse's or, or with your family at a holiday in your home. But we have church where we're in the presence of the Holy Spirit, and this is a place where the natural and the spiritual world meet at this altar, and there can be deliverance here. If you are press, pressed by financial woes, if you don't think you'll ever get out of debt, if you have a desperate need of your finances, if you dread finances, if you need for that chain to be broken, the anointing breaks every yoke, where you can go from dread due to money, uh, uh, facing bankruptcy, uh, foreclosure, whatever your, your, your deal is. If you run down right here, I'm going to give you some decrees. And that anointing is going to break the yoke because what comes out of your mouth, you're a speaking spirit. Now, look, forget everybody else. It's you that's going to go home to your bills. So uh, this is your opportunity this is not a dentist's office where we're going to put you in a chair and you're going to read a magazine and listen to elevator music. Uh, th this is where you come and you get your yoke broken. The anointing breaks every yoke. I'm going to wait a few minutes so that you can get over your distress. But there's somewhere along the line you're going to have to wake up and say, you know what, I got financial woes and problems or worries, or I, I have... A, uh, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. Whatever your issue is, because God gave me a couple of decrees. Now, remember, if you start saying things like, I don't know how I'll ever pay this off. I, I, I need more money. Uh, you know, whatever it is, oh, my God, recession, inflation, uh, depression, all those kind of things. You, you, you're sowing words out of fear and dread, and that's going to capitalize the enemy, the thief. When you turn around and come in agreement with the 7,000 promises that my God shall supply all of my needs. Jehovah Jireh supplies everything. When you begin to uh, come into agreement with the word and you speak it as a speaking spirit, you, your faith is going to manifest somewhere along the line. So be careful what you're sowing out of your mouth or you're going to get hung by your tongue. Understand that. 
So the only way to do is to make confessions based on the word of God. Now, uh, we're going to do this. The first one is, I, it's going to come on the screen. I am a believer, therefore I am a receiver. Let's say it. I am a believer, therefore I'm a receiver. How many are believing receivers, okay? Now, what you're going to have to do the next time you say, I don't know how I'm going to pay this. I, I don't know. It costs too much. I can't afford that. You're going to have to grab yourself by your foundation, pull yourself up and say, I'm a believer, therefore I'm a receiver. Understand that? You can't receive yourself unless you have that identity that you are a receiving believer. The next one is, I am believing for extravagant fa favor. I'm telling you, if you get up in the morning, expect. Faith is what you expect. If you get up in the morning and believe, I think God's going to surprise me with favor all day long. Now, if you want to believe for a little bit of favor, like all of a sudden there's a parking place. All of a sudden you tell her, bring me the check. Oh, some people over there paid it. Uh, if you do not expect it, it's not going to happen because faith is what you are expecting to happen. And the Bible says, if and you pray, believe you have it when you pray for it, when you speak it and come into agreement with it because you got 7,000 precious promises that's a banquet table waiting for you. And it doesn't have, have beanie weenies on it. It's a banquet table, okay? All right, now here's a big one. Put both hands up. I am believing for supernatural debt cancellation. Let's say it again. I am believing for supernatural debt cancellation. Now, supernatural debt cancellation means it's not natural. But how many people don't mind if lightning hits the computer and, and, and wipes it all out? Is that all right? I don't care how God does it. We want supernatural debt cancellation. All right. So instead of worrying all night long how I'm going to pay this bill, why don't you ask God who canceled all your sin debt, past, present, and future, that he can do the same thing for you. Now, this is how you do it. Say, God, I believe your name is Jubilee. Jubilee, read your Bible. He would cancel out all the debt. He said, well, that ain't fair. I don't care whether it's fair or not as long as he cancels it. Understand it? All right, now here's another one. I am believing for restoration and restitution. I am believing for restoration and restitution. Which means whatever you lost in the past, he can restore what the cake of worm has eaten. And restoration is all of you go back at least three generations. And if your grandpa lost everything you had gambling or, or whatever he did, understand that was your inheritance. And if the thief stole it, you can command it to get back because you're going to have to give it, leave an inheritance for the next three generations that way, okay? So you don't want the devil to keep anything. The next one is, I am believing for supernatural prosperity. You don't need more money, you need more belief in God. Right. Money is limited in what it can get for you. God can make a river in a desert. God can make a way where there is no way. God can open a door where there never was a door. God can give you a yes where there's always, but do not bow the knee to desire of more money. You want God's favor in your life, and it make manifest as more money. Do not bow the knee to mammon. All right. All right. Now, anybody here that owns a business, y'all stay right here. Anybody that owns a business, raise your hands, and I'm going to pray for increased favor and prosperity on every business represented here. And if you work for a business, it's, it's better for that business to prosper so that you can get a raise. Amen? Amen. 
All right. In Jesus name, we come into agreement. Every type of business, business owners, business workers, managers. I speak in the name of the most high on the direct Obedience to God's word, supernatural favor, increase a thousand fold in a time of famine, of inflation, in recession, in depression, that we sow and we expect an incredible harvest in Jesus name. Now give a shout of victory, shake it off in Jesus name. All right. All you fat cats, go back to your seat. We want to fight demonic oppression of lack and debt. Too many people walk the floors at night. There are too many uh, marriages and families that are unhappy and in trouble over financial problems and so on. I want us to move mentally at least out of a lost and dying world into the kingdom of God, which can not be shaken. In the financial world, they're always talking about uh, money movements and so on, and this, this does this and so on, and the stock market goes up and it goes down. The kingdom is on a rock that cannot be shaken. You have to move out of the world, pack up, Pack up and move into the kingdom where all the promises of God are already yes and amen, and it does not change. It's stable. Exchange your woe and your worry for faith and joy. There's three things. Wisdom, knowledge, and joy are promised to a citizen in the kingdom of God. Now, Financial supply is a constant faith fight. Why am I saying? Because it's really in the natural world that you have to live in, it's one thing after another. I mean, things, things are in supply, they're in abundance, things happen, termites move in, uh, the battery dies. These things are going to happen all the time. But you see, when you only live in the moment that you're in, you're always in faith in the throne room with the king. If you allow yourself to move from the presence of God, you're going to react emotionally and mentally to the world. In his presence is the fullness of joy. You keep your mind stayed on Jesus and his promises. You have intoxicating joy and supply comes to you. In the world, you're always reaching for something and you're always trying to protect something from loss. In the kingdom, it's always coming to you with no loss. Amen. Hebrews 11:6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to him must believe that he is who he says he is. He's a faithful father. I am a great grandfather now. I, I'm, I'm waiting on my any, any second now, maybe during this service, praise God. Uh, we're going to get the third great grandchild. As a grandfather, as a grandmother, as grandparents, we want the ultimate best for our children. And we are givers. God, is, we can't even imagine how much of a giver he is. He's given us joint airship with Jesus Christ. That, think about that. And he knows how raunchy and selfish we all are. And yet, that's how God loves us greater and wants to supply if we know he is a loving father. He chose to call us his children and himself a father. When we can believe he is who he says he is, we can receive from him and it's not dependent on what we do. It's, on, on, it's dependent on who we believe he is. Because you can't earn it. You have to believe it. Amen. If you can believe, all things are possible. But we keep trying to qualify ourselves to get his 
him, him to uh, be pleased with us. And we, it's always going to be, thy faith has made you whole. And by faith you please God. Nothing else. Yeah, thank you for the, the great applause there. This is not a one-time thing. You come into the altar, that's not like I anoint you with the fairy godfathers, boom, and all of a sudden your life changes. We're talking about this is a moment-to-moment -moment disciple thing where you're disciplined to have the mind of Christ, not the mind of the world. You want a mind full of faith that believes the promises of God, and you reject having the faith the mind of fear and dread of what's going to happen next. Amen. So when you change your beliefs about money, we begin to see ourselves more as the children of God who come into the kingdom with childlike faith that we really believe that God really loves us and is going to supply everything, and it's unconditional. Amen. you got to get out of the, yearn, the, the earning thing. You could never earn it. You can receive it by faith. So it's a major stronghold that you have to work on. Now, you, again, you have a failing economic system full of gloom and doom. We're not even finished with whatever this, we're in uh, inflation. Now, they always threaten now we're going in a recession, which causes you to be in depression before there's a, a depression. You follow that. So you have to quit believing the report of the world. They have no faith. They don't believe in God. They don't even know if they're a man or a woman. They don't know. I can tell them how to figure it out, but, you know, gee. Now, what I want you to do is listen to the words, not that they speak, that you speak. Out of the abundance of the heart, your strongholds of what you really believe is what comes out of your mouth. You can't say, I'm never going to get out of debt. I can never afford that. I should have stayed in college. I shouldn't have quit that job. Shut thou upeth. You're your worst enemy. You have to be a speaking spirit that comes into grace and only speaks what's in agreement with God so that he can manifest it. Not not the, 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 the death moans of a, of a world that's lost and godly. So the heart strongholds will always come out of your mouth. I always thought I was going to go to Paris, but now I see, you know, I, you, I'll never be able to afford it. You can't do that. You have to come into agreement with, with God, all things are possible. Amen. And quit. Again, as we just had the altar call, blaming yourself for what you didn't do in the past. That, that has nothing to do with the moment that we're in. Supernatural prosperity will not work for anyone who speaks in disagreement with the 7,500 promises. If God says that when you pray for anything you desire, believe that you have it. And if you don't pray to get it, and while you're praying, you don't think you're going to get it. Right. Well, you can't get it. Right. 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 So you can't speak fear, doubt, double-mindedness, regret. And here's a big one, ungratefulness. Yep. If you're not grateful for what you have in this moment to a, a sovereign God, you're not going to make the transition into the next moment nothing's going to change because if you can't manage the moment you're in, when you go into the next moment, you're dragging defeat and failure and doubt into the next moment. So you have to pick a moment and decide, I'm going to be a priestly king in, in the kingdom of God that has a banquet table set before me in the presence of my enemies and since I'm clothed in righteousness and full of the Holy Ghost and power and have dominion authority, I'm expecting this to happen. Amen. That my God should supply all my need. And I can do it without more money. Most Christians spend most of the time praying for more money 
instead of being at the feet of Jesus, uh, they're defeated. Believing that money is more important than faith in God. So prosperity only manifests through what I call faith speaking, faith sowing, and faith serving. Now, Mike and Elaine, when we got out of debt way back in the, when we first were Christians, when we realized we, did, we didn't know there was another way to live, okay? We weren't in gross debt. We didn't have much money, but we, we, we had credit card debt and a few things like that and a car note, things like that. Elaine first got the revelation. I went to a Bill Gotha thing on about Tuesday night. Uh, Monday night, I got real condemned when I found uh, the kingdom teaching. By Tuesday night, I was so convicted I couldn't stand it. By Wednesday night, I didn't think I was saved. You know, I mean, when I began to understand my life was in a train wreck and I never knew because I was living in the wrong kingdom. And we began to repent where we understood tithing and then we understood sowing. But when you no longer have any money to sow, you have time to serve with. So when you, if you tithe and you can't afford the offering, what do you do with your time? You can serve. Now, there's an old principle in life, even in the world, the more people you help to get what they want and need, the more you're going to get eventually what you need by helping other people, by serving other people. Now, let me tell you what Mike and Elaine do. We serve. Okay. That's not a braggadocio. Hear me. We use our time all day, all night, every day to serve as many people as we can. Therefore, the tsunami wave comes back over this way because when you don't have money, you have time to serve. People who don't serve anybody always have need. The more people you serve, the greater you're going to be rewarded supernaturally by, by God because that's how you do it. You sow money and you sow time in the form of service. That's why I applaud the people who come over here. You don't have to do that, but the clean toilets and vacuum and so on in the house of God, when you're serving, instead of sitting your butt on a sofa, uh, eating uh, uh, you know, homemade vanilla ice cream, watching the television, and then brooding over all your, what you need, Yeah, I, I know I'll have few people next week. You know why? Like Paul said, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth. So get your lazy butt up and serve somebody. You got that? The problem with people who don't serve, they feel entitled that everybody should give them something. And they're a dime a dozen. All right, so moving right along. Ask God, not other Christians. Now, right now, I don't, I don't know of any of them because I think most of them have, have left. But we used to have people that would meet you in the foyer, in the bathrooms, and in a parking lot and tell you their bad things. Do you know what they are? They're Christian, Christian beggars, okay? They know Christians want to give and so on, and they would meet you around there and tell you a sad story. And now I always tell people, if you really want to give, put it in an envelope and let it come through the church because we know stuff you don't know. Understand that? So instead of throwing your money, you could be sowing your money. Now, James 4.2 says, you lust and do not have. You covet and cannot obtain. You fight and quarrel, and yet you ask not. Now, I try to tell marriage couples when this happens, I said, look, instead of fighting one another, you spend too much money, we can't afford this, you shouldn't have bought that, and so on. Why don't you stop the war, separating, and grab hands and say, let's agree that God's going to get us out of debt and God's going to supernaturally uh, supply. Come into agreement rather than causing division, especially over mammon. Amen. Understand that? Now, instead of getting mad at each other, Hold hands and get mad as hell at the devil. He's the, he's the thief. Don't let him break agreement. 
Proverbs 13, 22 says, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children and his children's children and the wealth of the wicked in Joe Biden land is being stowed up for the church of Jesus Christ in the end time. Amen. All right. So what you have to do is understand if God says a righteous man, a good man leaves an inheritance, you can't leave somebody an inheritance if you don't have something for them to inherit. Amen. So God expected us to be well in prosperity. And the scripture even says God is thrilled to death at the prosperity of his children. So let's come into agreement with that. How many people want God happy? Okay, well then let him bless you in prosperity. I want him, I want him so happy he, 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 he's almost flipping out the throne. Understand that? Ecclesiastes 2.26, may those who delight in my vindication shout for joy and gladness. May they say always, the Lord be exalted who delights in the prosperity of his servants. Let's give him a shout. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. For God gives wisdom, Ecclesiastes 2.26. Now look, wisdom, knowledge, and joy. Ho, ho, ho. Wisdom, knowledge, and joy. Instead of dread and woe. And oh my God, what are we going to do? To those who are good, meaning righteous, in his sight, but to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and collecting so he can give it back to the righteous. What a scripture. What a scripture. All right, let's move on. Give, give me a... Okay, what do you know about money and finances? Well, I know I owe. I owe, I owe, so off the work I go. You remember the, the little dwarfs? Okay. Everybody needs biblical skill to obtain and keep financial supply. Why is that? Most people, if they get anything, they're not good stewards and they lose it quickly. I just read an article that showed all of the celebrities and NFL players who amassed hundreds of millions of dollars and they are totally bankrupt today. You know why? They didn't know how to handle money in the first place. They had a skill and a talent that caused them to get money, but they couldn't manage it. Now God says that he's gonna give you something and if you steward wisely, more comes. But if you're not faithful with the little, he takes the little and he gives it to somebody that will honor it and steward. Everything is about sowing and reaping and then managing, stewarding the harvest, recognizing that all, A-L-L, -L, all of it belongs to God. Not some of it, not 10% of it, all of it belongs to God. Why? You have officially been declared deceased by God. You reckon yourself as dead and you allow Christ now to live. Now, how many people, Father God, would like to bless the Son, Jesus? Well, get out the way so that he can bless the Son who wants to live the life through you. But when you own everything, then he's only your Savior. He's not Lord. And if he's not Lord of all, he's not Lord at all. You're going to have faulty thinking. Why? Because if you commit yourself, every word, every action, every decision unto his lordship, he establishes your thoughts in the mind of Christ and directs your step. But if not, he allows you to float your own boat. That's a scary thing. And the problem is most people squander what God gives them because they can't manage it correctly. If your financial beliefs and your actions and your decisions and your strategies and your plans are not working, shouldn't you just commit to doing something else? You know the old thing, mental illness is doing the same thing over and over again and always thinking something's going to change? 
You cannot do the same thing all the time and think there's going to be a change. That is truly natural mental illness. It's like the guy I tell you about, he's sitting there and he's hitting himself in the forehead with a hammer. And I said, what are you doing? Why do you keep sitting there hitting yourself in the head with a hammer? He said, because it feels so good when I stop. So people do the same thing all again and talking about when my boat comes in. You don't have a boat. You don't have a P-Rog. Shut up. What boat's coming up? You're in lunacy. You, you, know, you have no boat. And you have no aunt in San Francisco who's going to die and leave you something. Quit, the, quit inventing all of that foolishness. What you need to do is you got 7,500 promises of God and you got a commitment with God that you're gonna, he's gonna honor the covenant of Abraham with you as, a, as being a child of Abraham. And he's got a process, tithing and giving offerings and serving that is gonna cause you to be prosperous. But if you can't fit in God's plan, you don't think that you're gonna, you're gonna be able to, to do better than that. So if it's not working for you, adopt God's plan. Thank you, Steve. Wealthy people just might be rich because they know more about financial systems than you do. Now, why did we put May? Because a guy went to the 7-Eleven and he put a dollar on one ticket. He spent $5 on cigarettes and a beer and $1 on a lottery ticket, but he won $100 million. But, but he ain't going to keep it. But... But he's not rich because he understands money. Right. You understand that? Yep. So there are people that, that got an inheritance or whatever they did. There are drug lords out there that have millions of dollars, but they don't, they, they don't know anything about the money world, okay? So we're talking about generally somebody who knows about money and how to make money and how to manage money is going to do better than somebody who doesn't know how to handle money and doesn't understand it. We know this because Hosea 4, 6 says, my people, not the world, my people fail and are destroyed because of lack of knowledge. Is that right? Yes. Now, let me ask you something. No one took a course on how to be pregnant, how to be married, how to have children, understand that? So most of us were raised by people who never got the book on how to handle a family or raise children or be married or handle finances. So we all just like imitate the home of origin or whatever we think is on television or in the magazine or whatever. So it's the blind leading the blind. But God said there's a better way. I got 66 books in the Bible that tell you how to live in the kingdom. Okay. So Warren Buffett, for example, is not wealthy because of real estate. He's wealthy because of his knowledge of how real estate works in the business realm. Is that right? Donald Trump. is not wealthy because of real estate. It's his knowledge of the principles of real estate. Right. We just sell houses and buy houses, but we don't, we don't know all what they know. Now, for example, the doctor that charges you so much money, the reason why you pay him is that he has knowledge about how your body works than you do. Right. Right. All right? Now, he can't even sign his name legibly, but he knows about... Your, your, your kidneys and your esophagus. Got that? Okay. All right. So Luke 16, 8 says, the sons of this world, of this age, are wiser than the children of light in the money world. Why? They're under the God mammon. Well, we're under Jehovah. And we don't know anything about that world. And so consequently... You can be lied to, sued, uh, in debt over the world system because they are creatures of darkness. I always say this. My brother and I lived uh, in old Algiers, and there was the Follies Theater in Ab Abaddon. And they would have a, 
Saturday morning matinee. So we would walk together from my dad's seafood market down the street to go in the matinee. So we pay our dollar and go in to watch the matinee. And when we go in, as soon as they open the doors and you go into the theater, you couldn't see anything. I mean, because we were in light and we went into the darkness. But the people that were already in the place, they, they could see popcorn on the floor or quarter on the floor because they were already in darkness, so they had better sight than people that were in the light. We in the light don't function well in their world. This is why the corrupt congressmen and senators and all amass millions of dollars, because they are creatures of the darkness. Yes. Yeah. And they live in, the, in that money world, understand, of, of wealth for ill-gotten gain, where a Christian, that's a foreign world. God wants us to be in the kingdom of light where we understand money and prosperity according to God's righteousness for the proper use because we don't do well in a world that we be blinded by because our, our light causes us to be blinded in that world. All right? Now, in Romans 12, 1 through uh, 2, I appeal to you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God, which is the spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to that world. Because if you do, you will marinate in that world and you will pick up beliefs that become strongholds that limit you because God does not want you successful in that world because God is a jealous God you will destroy your eternal potential by excelling in that world. It will be temporal gain only, but you will release, re lose eternal reward because you're functioning in an illegal world. You should be a pilgrim passing through a world that is not your home. So we don't need a new job, a new wife. We need a new mind that has God's knowledge and wisdom and joy in it, which is the mind of Christ. So you can't figure your finances out only in your mind. God's not going to allow that to happen because God does not want you fornicating and adulterizing with another system. That's why he tells you, you either love mammon or you love Jehovah. So before external financial success, we must change our internal financial beliefs about getting money, maintaining wealth, and about wealthy people. Now, I've told people before, if you watch television and you see somebody laying hands like Benny Hinn uh, in a healing thing, and you go, oh, I don't believe that. That guy's a shyster. That's not true. Well, don't expect to get a healing from God. And if you look at Jesse the planter, say, oh, man, that guy's a thief, man. I tell you, I don't believe in that prosperity, man. Well, you'll know, save your pennies because you're not going to be prosperous. Be careful what you judge. When you grow up and think, all lawyers are crooks. Well, you never went to law school. How do you know? Okay. But if that works for you, or all wealthy people, all wealthy people got their, their lies, their cheating, you know, you know, when you judge something like that, understand that judgment will come back on you and will keep you from being able to be blessed. Amen. So what you do is make sure you're not jealous and envious or you learned it in a home of origin to be prejudiced against people who are successful because when you judge success or judge wealth or judge prosperity in somebody else, you are not going to reap that, that judgment in your own life. Amen? Amen? All right. It's like somebody says, I don't, you know, money's cold, hard. And I go, no, it's warm and it's soft and it folds up in my back pocket. And since I have no hiney, I got padding of $100 bills in there when I sit down. You see, you got to change how you feel and think about money and wealth. And understand, wealth can cause you to do the will of God in a lost world. Ecclesiastes is strong. It says, the poor man knew how to win the war, but nobody listened to him because he was poor. 
You understand that? So a wise man that's wealthy, people listen to that, even if you don't like them, because it registers success and power and understanding. So question your family beliefs, because most of what you, who you, your identity is or what you think is possible came in between zero being born in the first three years where just about most, most of your personality and identity was locked into your brain when you were wide open. So question your family beliefs about money, prosperity, wealthy people, because your home of origin beliefs become childhood heart truths. Demonic strongholds will keep you in lack. Now, for example, I hear this all the time. Uh, we were poor, but we were all, mama always kept us clean. You, say, you understand? Well, like, poor is not bad because we were clean. Instead of, thank God, we were poor, mama kept us clean, but she told us to read the Bible so that we could be prosperous. Yeah. Instead of a closed system that is a reason and excuse for you to stay poor as long as you're clean. Right. You understand that? All right, so there are a bazillion of them out there like that racial prejudice, religious prejudice, uh, gender prejudice, that are things that you heard in childhood that locked you as heart beliefs, which causes it to come out of your mouth, which barricades you from God being able to do something supernatural in your life because your stronghold has such a stronghold on you, you can't grasp the spiritual principles. So you're locked in. Colossians 2, 8 warns us of this, beware that no man ruin you or take you captive through philosophy and empty deceit, which is based on human tradition and a home of origin and the basic principles of this world and not in accordance with Christ. Be careful when you don't recognize the strongholds you have and again, I've said it 10 times, I'm going to say it again. Be careful what comes out of your mouth. That's an indication. Remember, the tongue is the dipstick of the crankcase of your heart. Because Jesus said, what comes out of your mouth is an indication of the beliefs that are in the heart. And if there's conflict between the word of God and what you believe in your heart, you're canceled out. That's why meditation on the word of God is so important because that's when your mind is being renewed because you come in agreement with the word. This book of the law, Joshua 1.8, shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate upon it day and night in order to observe, to do all that is written therein. Then you will have great success and everything in your life will prosper. That principle is not going to change. So instead of your mind managing the money, most of the time our money is managing our mind. You can't have anxiety over your debt or lack or your financial situation without your mind giving you a vain imagination affecting your emotions. Instead of you have to reserve, you let the mind of Christ discipline and steward your money situation. Because if you let your, your money, which is alien to Christianity, if you let it manage your, your thought life and your imagination, you're going to be paralyzed. But you have to let the mind of Christ take dominion over the things of the natural world. Amen. Now, here's a big one. Malachi 3.8. This is God speaking. This is not a, a prophet. This is God. Yeah. Will a man rob God? That's an incredible statement. Well, a man, does a man have the gall to rob God? And here's it. You are cursed with the curse. Let me tell you, it's a, that's a bad thing to have God put a curse on you. The ultimate authority put a curse on you because you're robbing God. And he goes, yet you're still robbing me. Bring the full tithe. Why? People say, I tithe. They don't really tithe. You see, they, they, their tithe is based on how much they really want to give. And, they, you know, they, people, I hear from people all the time, look, when I get my check, should I gross tithe 
or should I just net tithe? Let's see, that's a justification in the mind that I don't want to pay the full tithe because, you know, I got to give some to income tax. I have to do this. No, I understand. Number one, it ain't yours. If you're a Christian, everything that you have, including your breath, already belongs to God. You sold out. And dead people, don't, they, don't, they, they don't own anything. Is that right? So bring the full tithe into the storehouse so that there may be abundance in my house. Test me, prove me, says the Lord. If I not open windows of heaven and pour out for you blessings without measure, I will rebuke the devourer for you. Now go all the way down to the last word. Instead of God putting a curse on you, God turns around and blesses you by stopping the thief and the devourer. Wow. That's powerful. Oh, thank you. I said to a man, do you know where your money goes? He says, yeah, away. <laughs> Another guy said, I said, you know, the Bible says money answers every, 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 uh, everything. He says, yeah, mine says goodbye. <laughs> and you hear people all the time say, I don't know where my money goes. Listen, you're in bad shape if you don't know where your money goes. You better not give it permission to leave you so easily. Amen. Remember, the kingdom works on two things, sowing and reaping and stewardship. You can sow, get an abundant harvest, but then lose it by not stewarding it. Understand that? So people that make a lot of money but don't steward it well, tend on lose it and God says I will take the little you have and give it to somebody who has a lot because he understands stewardship because it all belongs to me. The tithe is what rebukes loss and it's the offering that welcomes prosperity. Now, when Elaine and I were first getting out of it, we went to the Bill Gotha thing, and we realized that, that we were out, out, of, out of order there. We weren't bad people. We just did, didn't know. We, my people perished for lack of knowledge. So we knew immediately to tithe. And then certainly Elaine got the vision on giving offerings because if you tithe, that's great, but that just makes you not a thief, not cursed, and just even, but there's no prosperity in it because you're not sowing. So when you begin to, what we did is we gave the tithe and then whatever percentage we could sow, and then little by little as we got momentum, we would sow more and more until we were many times sowing more than just the tithe because that's how you cash your bread and that's how the tsunami starts coming back over you because it makes that whole circle, all right? And you get to the point where the scripture says that the reaping and the sowing is like in one action, that you can't, you can't reap, sow as fast as you're already reaping the harvest because you begin to get momentum, but you can't stop. And God showed me, because I had a flatboat, aluminum flatboat, I'm going 45 miles an hour down the bayou. As long as I'm doing that, that boat's up and I'm moving. But if all of a sudden the engine killed, all the back weight comes up and sinks the boat. Wow. Well, and the positive thing is the more you sow in your bread across the water, eventually there's a tsunami that overtakes you. And the Bible says it will overtake you. The blessings will overtake you. But you have to keep that going. But first you got to believe in it. And you got to discipline to do it, but you got to do it in faith. And the faith doesn't really come until you have become obedient to it. So people say, Brother Mike, should I tighten my belt? Well, I do, so my pants don't fall down. Okay. There are only two natural methods of financial prosperity. Number one is to decrease your spending in your expenses. That's called a budget. That's a good thing. It's money management. Second thing is increase your cash flow that comes in. Now remember, most people live off a salary. A salary is limited. 
You should have a job. You should have salary. But you can't just live off your salary because the salary is limited. You got only so many hours you can work, only so much money per hour, only so many days, only so many years. And so it's limited. But income is unlimited because you could make $100 a week, but if $1,000 came in, or if somebody gave you a car that you didn't have to spend, that's income. Don't make the mistake of not tithing on the income that you didn't work for, all right? Or you won't have more income. So let's go a little bit further. Uh, budgets have limitations because budgets are based on salary. You can't budget income because income is something that comes in and it's not regular. But you can budget what you already have. Remember, faithful with the little, you get the increase. If you're not faithful with the little, you lose what you have. That's the Bible principle. So in a budget, though, there's only so much you can decrease. You can't decrease your, your electric bill. You can't de de decrease your, your car note. You can't decrease your, uh, your, your basic living expenses. Those are set, okay? And they'll probably increase as we go on. So... When you do that, that's a way of doing it, but you get to the point where you still don't have enough to move into prosperity. And when you are decreasing your spending, you're probably going to uh, limit the, the lifestyle that you really want to have. You understand that? You really want to have this lifestyle, but you can't afford it. Well, when you budget to be able to get out of debt, then you have to decrease that lifestyle. And a lot of people don't want to give up something. Right. Understand that? They feel like I, we, we, this is what we do. And they have an entertainment uh, 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 part of their budget. So God promises lifestyle choice by sowing and reaping. So in other words, you sow in the lifestyle, the type of lifestyle, until you get a harvest in that area. If you want cantaloupes, you don't plant broccoli seeds. So God gave choice. You plant into the lifestyle, but you sow, it looks like it's gone, but then you get a harvest somewhere out there in Never Never Land. Many people can't wait that long. So budgeting is good money management because God blesses stewardship. Expectation of deliverance from lack and debt could limit the marital and family frustrations that you go through by budgeting. When you call a family together, we can't do this. We won't go on vacation this year. Oh, you said we're going to go to Disney World. Yeah, well, we, you know, we're going to save money. We can't go now. Now, here's the deal. When you realize without a vision the, the, your, most of the King James says, people, the, without a vision, but the, the, the original Hebrew says this, without a vision, people cast off restraints. They get sloppy. Oh, there's no hope. So if you have a vision of prosperity, supernatural prosperity, you can get everybody together and come into agreement that this is going to happen. And so the grace comes upon you, whatever you have to sacrifice, because you know where you're going. So we say, oh, we're going to go to Disney World Friday. What do we have to do? Well, I got to cut the grass. I got to do this. You know, so everybody gets together and they do whatever they need to do because they, they want to go, they want to do that. Well, you have to have a godly vision of being out of debt and being prosperous and doing kingdom work so that everybody has the grace to move in that sacrificial thing. Amen. So Proverbs 10, 14 and 15, wise people store up knowledge, but the words of the foolish is near to destruction. The rich man's wealth is his strong fortress. The destruction of the poor man is his poverty. Now, what is he saying? It, it comes out of the story in the Bible. It says, 
There was a war going on. The enemy was coming. And a poor man had a word of knowledge. He had the plan on how he could save the city from the destruction. But because he was poor, nobody listened to him. If he'd have been a rich man, they would have listened to him. Well, God's saying the world is not going to listen to us if the church is bankrupt. So true. So true. Understand that? That's why the wealth of the wicked is going to be transferred to the church because the church now is going to have the gold and the golden rule. He who has the gold rules. Everybody understand that? All right, so let's talk about the fact that a poor person is poor because their poverty is their bankrupt thinking. Understand? They don't have the mind to be able to steward money, and they have no expectation. So if you give them money, they won't spend it wisely, and, but they will still have entitlement that somebody else needs to take care of me. So instead of serving, they're always waiting to be served, and they're resentful for anybody who doesn't serve and give to them. That's a demon. Yes. All right. Let's talk about su supernatural supply, and I'm going to close this till next week. Mark 11, 24, whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you have them and it will be yours. Now, this is the word of God. This is not Zig Ziglar. This is not some writer of a book. The word of God says, if you desire something, now remember, God says he will supply our needs. Philippians 4, 19. In abundance so that we have some to tithe and give away. He gives us the same amount of time each day to serve other people. So we sow and we serve our way into prosperity. But then God says, when your need is met, you just have relief until the next time you need something. But when you have a desire that, that maybe even money couldn't buy, your joy might be full. So God's guaranteed our need, if we can believe that, but also if you can desire it and believe that God is who he says he is, you can receive it so that the joy of the Lord now becomes your strength to do anything that you need to do. Amen. So it's your yearning power, not just your earning power. Earning power is limited. Yearning power is unlimited. So it's the idea of salary versus income, but what you want is salary plus income. Yeah. Amen. For example, I can afford to go to Zia's, take Elena lunch. I can't tell you how many times we go to, out to a restaurant because we pray first, we know where, where we're going, and I go to pay the bill, and somebody I don't even know who paid the bill. That's just a little thing. I could afford it. I had the money in my pocket. But it's the joy of the Lord blessing us with favor. Understand that? Now, the Bible says there are houses you didn't buy in mortgage. There are wells you didn't dig. There are orchards you didn't plant that can be given to you where God just does this to money, and he just gives it to you. Okay? God wants to show and be glorified over his authority over over mammon. Amen. So a regular salary is designed to pay your cost of maintenance. Supernatural increase creates options and opportunities in the lifestyle. All right. Last word, your financial growth is completely, completely dependent upon your belief growth. The more you can believe God and expect that you have it, the more favor with God supernatural happens because it shows, again, the confirmation of the covenant with Abraham that he gives us the ability to create great wealth. Why? That the kingdom of God might be exalted. Last scripture, John 3, 3 uh, John uh, 1 and 2. Beloved, I pray that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. I preached this one time, and a man said, man, that's just a salutation in a letter. I said, well, it is to you. To me, it's a promise. 
okay? So it's either just a salutation to a letter, or it's the word of God, and I reply, as my faith is, so be it unto me. Would you stand, please? We're going to take this back up next week. <laughs>